right, we're going to dive right in because we've got uh, 60, 58 minutes to go through quite a bit of, of content. Now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the command line, a lot of things in there. And I'm not going to go through and be totally exhaustive about it. I'm not going to do just a tour of syntax. We're going to take a, a slightly different approach. But my goal for this session is to start you on a journey to go from copy pasta novice to command line wizard. And by the end to, of, of the session today, you will be well on your way in that direction. And there will be plenty of more, plenty more room for you to grow out your skill tree. I'm Michael Carducci. I, um, this is embarrassing. <laughs> you ever have that happen? You end up, we should, this, a, a phone call, an email could have settled this. We wouldn't be standing here, uh, dressed identically. Well, that's me. That's my avatar. All right. Well, we're, well I want to start with this with a little bit of history because I, did, I was not, uh, forgive the pun, born into this world. I, I found my way into this world much, much later in my career. And I'll tell you a little bit why. If you were in the keynote earlier today, you know my first computer was an Apple IIgs. Woo! Okay, just me. Now, the Apple IIgs came with a disk operating system called Prodos, and uh, inside of Prodos there were a handful of commands. Catalog would list what is on the disk. You could run something, you can rename something, you delete something, load something, run something, save something, verify. There's a couple more, but this was largely it. If you wanted more, you'd write like a basic program or something like that, and off you go. But it didn't do a whole lot. And I didn't think too much about it. The next computer that I eventually got was a Macintosh. And if you were going from any kind of disk-based, disk operating system, command line type operating system like that, to something like this, a graphical user interface, it felt like a huge step forward from the command line. And this was largely where I lived. And I remember in the 90s, I was talking to people, and I'd say, what are you on? Are you on Windows or a Mac? And one guy I was talking to says, oh, I'm using Slackware, which was an early Linux distribution. It's still around, actually. But it was an early Linux distribution. I mean, everything at that point was early in the Linux world. And I remember thinking, why would you go backwards? And then a few years later, I had a job. I was working somewhere, and I noticed a lot of the developers were using something called Sigwin. And... I figured it was just like a compatibility layer, that these are the commands that I have in my muscle memory. I didn't realize. I just figured they, they wanted compatibility, not capabilities. And I didn't know what I was missing, so I didn't care. A lot of it really felt like geek cred. Do you know what I mean? Like, there were people out there doing this stuff the hard way, just to show, just as some kind of, like, geek flex. Look at me. I'm doing everything the hard way on the command line. And I've got to tell you, I was wrong. And it annoys me that it took me so long to th realize the power of this tool. Now, sure, a command line interface is not as easy as point and click when you're new to it, but it can be far more effective. It allows for automation that's not possible with the graphical user interface. There's whole sequences of commands can be run from scripts. They can be applied to large numbers of files. All of this with a single command. Now. There's a lot out there. I found this wallpaper, and it was just sort of a cheat sheet. And this is just a little bit. This is the tip of the command line iceberg out there. And there's a lot of tools out there. And individually, they're useful, but together, they are powerful. And that's the really wild thing. So I want to focus on a few that are immediately useful. And rather than just, like I said, do a tour of syntax and just stand up here and dryly type this in and that in and da-da-da, and this does this and that does that, I want to do something a little more fun. So we've got a little bit of a, of a, of a theme today. We'll play the game. Said I'd turn the volume way up. Maybe I need to turn it down a little bit. So, you saw my keynote earlier today. There was a little bit of magic. And magic is interesting, right? Because you learn a move, one little move. That does not a magician make. Over time, you get these pieces that you can start putting together in different ways. A couple of moves, a couple of principles. You put them together this way, you've got a magic trick. You put them together a different way, you've got another magic trick. Before you know it, everybody in the room is sitting on a six of clubs. 
And it's the same kind of thing. This is why I like this wizard thing, because it's the same kind of thing with Unix and the Linux command line and all of this stuff, bash, these shells, that this is why I like this wizard theme. Because individually, each command, it's like an individual spell for a wizard. You know one spell, two spells, cool. When you start putting them together, you can conjure entirely new realities at will. So to quote Brian Kernigan, the Unix philosophy of software tools made it possible to combine existing programs to, you know, to accomplish a wide variety of tasks without having to write new software. It's a programming instance of an old strategy, divide and conquer. By breaking bigger tasks into a smaller one, each one becomes more manageable and the pieces can be combined in unexpected ways. Now, Linux is everywhere. It's an open source version of Unix, as you probably know, which came out of Bell Labs. Brian Kernigan was kind of around at Bell Labs during that time with a lot of the other people. And the core of Unix was built in just three weeks. And it was really interesting how they approached this because they were basically building the tools that they needed to build this operating system kind of in parallel. And every time they had a new thing they needed to do, they would just build another little tool. And these started to form the foundation of the commands. And so the, the very first shell and the very first collection of apps they had, they used to call it the programmer's workbench because they, they were just phenomenally useful thing, useful tools. And then, you know, after that, Steve Bourne, that's where my pun comes from, wrote a new shell and incorporated a lot of the programmer's workbench stuff along with a bunch of enhancements. And Unix has always had a rich collection of these little command line tools, programs that handle frequently occurring tasks. And in effect, the tools are the verbs in a language and the files are the nouns that the verbs apl ap apply to. So like spells in a wizard's rep repertoire or slights in a magician's repertoire, these tools allow you to conjure up whatever you can imagine as you need it. And so, in our little game, as we're going and exploring this space and leveling up, we're going to meet a lot of mentors on the way, and uh, they're going to guide us through our different levels as we uh, progress through a skill tree and become more powerful wizards. And our first mentor, of course, is Tux. You'll meet many mentors who impart knowledge, spells, and wisdom. At each stage in your journey, you will level up and become a more powerful wizard. First, you must learn the foundations of your craft. Complete this stage to become a no novice wizard. And so we have a whole skill tree, and we're just going to kind of start to go through this. Now, what I've done is I've got just a shell here. Hopefully this works. And is that font an adequate size for everybody? Perfect, perfect. And we're just going to go through this. And we're going to start with the basics, and we're going to build this out into something useful and powerful and customized for whatever it is we need to do. So to start with, I'm going to assume you're familiar with some of the basics, just kind of jumping around. I'm going to go quickly over this piece because I want to get to some of the more, more interesting stuff, but I want to give you a foundation. So one of the most foundational things that you're going to need to do is navigate the file system. Now, when we drop into a shell, typically, uh, we start in our home directory, and this is indicated with a little tilde. As you can see, it's his wizard at blah, blah. I'm in a Docker image right now, uh, just as a playground. Uh, I've got all of this written up on my GitHub. If you want to go and, and play around with this a little later on, go through some of the exercises. So one of the most basic commands that we can do is PWD, or print working directory. And it will just tell us whatever directory we're currently in. And I can also go in here and type ls to list the contents of the directory. And it's just, a, again, a, an abbreviated form. Hidden files are hidden. But we can include the hidden files just by passing in a little, little flag in here, a little, a little option, like dash a shows us everything. So it's showing us our hidden files, our bash logout, our bash rc, which is sort of our, our profile. There's a bunch of other uh, random bits and pieces in here. Now we can get a more detailed listing with dash l. And now I've got who owns it, what permissions are on the files, the file size, when they were created, things like that. And of course, I can combine these flags to get everything, the long form, with all of the files, not just the hidden things. So I can, I can uh, change directories by typing the, uh, the cd command. So if I, if I create something, demo1, uh, let's just do that, I can cd demo1. I can change directories with cd, and again, I can see what's in there. There's nothing in there right now except for the dot and the double dot. Now, the single dot represents the current directory. The double dot uh, specifies the parent directory. So 
Again, if I print the working directory, I can say I'm in home wizard demo one. And uh, if I CD uh, to a dot, it keeps me where I'm at. If I CD with a double dot, it takes me up one level. The other thing I can do is from wherever I am, I can change directories into my home directory with the tilde. And again, a lot of this is probably uh, where most people are familiar with. Uh, one other thing we can do is we can step backwards uh, one step where we've been with the, with the dash and that will take us to wherever it was we were before. But let's go back to our demo one in our home directory and uh, we'll look at a, a few more kind of commands in this space. Uh, one of the things you commonly see is this, uh, this uh, uh, command touch. So if I touch foo, it's going to create, in this case, a new empty file. So if I, I, can, I can do this again, Uh, and just kind of touch a bunch of these things. So now if I ls, I can see all these new files here. If I do the long form, there they are. Now what's interesting is uh, uh, touch, it, it, it's not really supposed to create a new file, but it will. It's sort of a side effect of what it does. Uh, really the idea is if I touch a file, I really, mo I've just, if I touch it, I've modified it. I've modified the access date time. So if I go in here now and I say touch bar and I, and I look at this again, uh, you can see I, I've done this a little too quickly, so it's uh, maybe I need to wait for the time to update by one minute. But if I touch it again, it's going to update the, the modified date, st date stamp to uh, whatever the current date is. Uh, in this case, uh, UTC, I think, is what the time zone for this uh, Docker image that I'm, that I'm in here for. So a few other basic ones, copy. CP. And now, interestingly enough, one of the things that makes the command line so unfriendly for the novice is everything, all of the commands seem to be like hyper abbreviated. Now, there's a reason for this. You've got to remember they were building this in the 60s. They had these giant teletype machines that were about as big as this podium. And that's what you typed into. Now, there wasn't a screen or two or three or all of these. It's a roll of paper. And so these were also big, heavy steel mechanical devices and it took a lot of effort just to press these keys and so just to avoid the fatigue they abbreviated everything there's a great book by the way if you get a chance to to, to go seek it out it is uh, uh brian kernigan the, the the gentleman that i had up on the slide just a moment ago it's called unix a history and a memoir and it talks about uh the creation of unix and the broader culture at bell labs super interesting definitely worth a read but yeah so to copy a file it's, uh, we give it the, the file we want to copy and where we want it to go to. So I could send it to new foo. And if I look again, now I've got foo and new foo. Um, another one is move. Um, it's a throwback to the, again, to the late 60s. Because as a throwback to the late 60s, it's not only a way to move a file so I can move uh, new foo to uh, the parent directory if I want. And now it is in there. But uh, yeah, there's my new foo. But uh, another thing that we old, that we often do is uh, use as a throwback. We use the move to move a file into well, basically to rename the file. So if I move it to the same location with a new file name, with, then that's what it's going to do. So I'm going to move uh, foo to uh, old foo, and and now we've just renamed that. So if I want to remove a file, I can I can do that. RM old foo. If uh, but if I go in here, I can't remove I can't remove demo one. Uh, let's my my with the typo. Let's throw the wherever my equals was there. Uh, it's not gonna let me do that because it's a directory. So there's actually a second a second command for that remove directory demo one equals and it will go ahead and allow me to do that. But if I try to rmdir demo1, it's going to say, oh, you can't do that, directory is not empty. So the, the, the key thing is the rm command supports a recursive flag to remove files from a directory recursively all the way down the tree and then remove the directory itself. So if I rm-r demo1, it's going to take everything out and now all of that stuff is gone. I'm going to go ahead and clean up my new foo and off we go. Um, likewise, another thing we can do is copy a file, copy a folder direct, uh, recursively using the dash r flag there. Uh, 
And one of the things that you're going to start seeing is a lot of these concepts, conventions, start uh, showing up all over the place. And, and so it really does become uh, kind of snowballing knowledge as you go through all of this. So if, uh, so I can uh, definitely, uh, so I can, I can copy a file uh, directory recursively, things like that. Uh, another really common thing that you'll see is this uh, cat command. And a lot of times if I do this, if I cat my bash RC, it's just gonna dump the entire contents onto the screen. Uh, don't worry too much about what's in here just yet. We'll get to some of that. But uh, that's just kind of another thing. But one of the problems with this, of course, is there's, there's far too much in here to view within my screen, within my terminal without having to scroll back. So if I want to just look at the first couple of lines, I can actually use the head command. So if I, if I head bash RC, uh, this is going to, by default, it's going to give me the first 10 lines. Uh, likewise, if I want to look at the last 10 lines, I can uh, bash RC. I can get just the last 10 lines. I can clear what's on the, my terminal using the clear command. And uh, don't worry too much about the phi and the ESAC and all of those things, but uh, because what's in that profile is not just configuration, it's actually a script that runs when we log in. Uh, a few other things, again, you can modify these commands a lot of different ways. So for example, head dash N5 bash RC, I can look just at the first five. So all of these are just tiny little single purpose utilities to solve a problem, whatever that problem is. And all of these flags, you don't have to necessarily memorize all of those. They are available in the manual. So if I say man head, I actually get this, uh, the, the, the manual pages. These, these are not super uh, what I would call readable. There's, but again, this is a very hackable, very malleable, very, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really a playground for however you want to create your work environment. So one of the things that I use, I use a command called TLDR. I learned about from another speaker, Brian Sletton. And, um, TLDR basically is sort of community man pages. So TLDR, I think it runs in Node. So you can NPM install TLDR and run that from the command line. And it will actually go and fetch better documentation and give that to you. So it's, it's certainly very, very useful. Now, the early users at Bell Lab, though, I'm going to come out of here. The early users of Bell Lab, uh, they quickly added another command as uh, in addition to head and tail. They added one called more. And so if I more bash RC, this starts giving me the ability to sort of page through this. I can page up and down. I can page up and down because it's not actually running more. And I'll get to that in a minute as well. Um, in fact, they're using something called less is, is in fact what, I, what I'm using. So somebody created more way back in the day at Bell Labs. But in 1983, there was a guy named Mark Noodleman. And he didn't like that more only scrolled one direction and you couldn't scroll backwards. So he developed less and threw that out there. It's shown up everywhere now. It's kind of the standard installation. But uh, I guess the joke there was uh, less is more. Get it? <laughs> yeah. So if I uh, so so in fact, right now in this particular installation as a as a as a Ubuntu Docker image that I've kind of thrown together for this work for this session. Uh, more is already a le more is less is already alias to the more command. So when I type more, I get less. And now a lot of these things really uh, less is going to do a lot more than just allow you to kind of page up, page down, scroll interactively through a file. Uh, but what's really interesting was Mark Noodleman was using the Berkeley standard distribution, BSD3, and he added the tool there. But now it's everywhere. Right? Everybody has it. And he didn't have to recompile the, pile the shell to add the command. And it really speaks to this modular approach to, to how they developed the original Unix shell. All of the commands are stored in a handful of locations. Every single one is a standalone app. None of these really belong to Bash. All that happens when you type a command, Bash is going to search a couple of different places that have already sort of been predefined, and it's going to see what it finds, and that's what it's going to match on. 
So that's a big part of that modular architecture that everything is pluggable. So one of the things I can do in here is I can say, where is less? And it will, it will tell me. It says, ah, oh, it's in USR bin less. And uh, I can see what else is in there. So I can say USR bin. And here is all of those all of those commands that have been dropped into just that directory, that USR bin. And these are just some of the commands that we have available to us, but there are really so many more. So unlike the Apple ProDOS, Apple DOS, and a lot of these other shells that we might have used on other systems, I can add all kinds of capabilities without having to upgrade, without having to, ins without having to do anything other than make that file available to the, the, the handful of directories that are being searched in the path. Um, and so we'll talk about the path here. So let's look at this. Another command you'll see a lot is echo. And what does echo do? Yeah, it, exactly that. It just it just kind of dumps out whatever you get. You give it hello world, it's going gonna, it's gonna to just dump back out to standard out hello world. And that means if I want to see what's in the path variable, echo dollar path, it will, it will give me that. And so these are the locations that it searches in the order that it searches. Uh, starting with the USR local, then USR lo or SBIN, USR local BIN, USR SBIN, USR BIN, SBIN, BIN. And I won't go into what these all mean. There's, there's plenty of stuff out there on, uh, on what kind of should go where. But there's a lot of places that these things can ultimately go. Um, I can also see all of my envir environment variables by using this command, print env. And again, it's not an OS command. It's just another one of these utilities in one of the bin directories, specifically uh, let's do where is. Where is uh, uh, print env? It's in USR bin. There it is again. And so this is a big part of what makes it such a malleable work environment. So like I said before, Linux is basically just an open source implementation of Unix. And most of the folks using Unix back in those days, they were all developers. And they built all these little apps to make it more useful to the kind of work they were doing. And a lot of these just found their way into standard distributions over the next decade or so. And notably, one thing to remember is that because every command is just a file at the end of the day, remember that Linux typically uses a case-sensitive file, file system, which means that the commands are case-sensitive. So if I say, where is, and I'll just do that, where is print env, that'll work. But if I say, where is print env, it's not going to find that because of that case sensitive thing. Uh, one of the other important decisions that the earlier ver versions of Unix started to make was they wanted to make the OS portable to other computers. So they built it once and they, they said, hey, this is really cool. It would be even cooler if it ran on more than one specific platform. So at that point, the C language and the standard libraries were starting to get standardized and they ported Unix from assembly over to C. And it's more or less true today that if you install a new app, it mostly involves pulling down the source code, uh, pulling down the source code, building, installing complex tree of dependencies. And if you've ever tried to do this by hand, it's kind of a hassle. It's kind of a lot of a hassle. Because you pull the source code down, you try to run make, and it's going to say, hey, you don't have this dependency. Okay, well, I'll pull that down, try to make that, and this can go on for a while. And so package managers were born. And uh, so my little demo environment is based on Debian Linux, and it uses a package manager called apt. If you're running a Red Hat based distribution like Red Hat Enterprise or CentOS or Fedora or whatever they replace CentOS with now, I, I'm not sure. I lose track of some of this stuff from time to time. Uh, you'd be using Yum. If you're using uh, Suzy, it'd be Yast, I think. It's, uh, does that sound right? All right. I got some nods. I'll go with that. But. Um, so, for example, let's see if I have the, the nano text editor. So, uh, we have where is uh, nano, and it's not finding anything. Another, another option that gives us some variety in here is, the, is which, because sometimes you'll say where is, and it'll say, well, we have one here, we have one here, and we have one here. And when you say which nano, or which print env, or which whatever, it will say specifically, you type this in, this is where we're going to end up. So if I say which nano, 
it's not going to give me anything back because I don't have this installed. So I'm actually going to install this. I'm going to say apt install nano. Now when I do this, it will fail because installing software generally requires elevated permissions. Now again, back in the day, we would type su to switch user and we would switch user into the root user or something like that and then we'd run a command and a lot of people said, you know what, I find myself all the time switching user and then running a command and then going and then dropping back into my normal shell. So they said, you know what, I'm going to do this. Sudo or sudo or I, I've heard it both ways. I'm wrong at least half the time. I'll go back and forth. That way I'm only wrong 50% of the time. But this is a uh, this is a command that will uh, run whatever you give it in that elevated set of permissions and then drop back right back to where you were. So I can rerun this whole thing. But um, another interesting thing, just you get out of the box with a shell, is history. So I can see here's all of the commands I've typed, and I can cycle through these individually. But a useful trick just to have in your back pocket. So I'll run that and it says, are you root? No, I'm not. So I could just type the whole thing out again. I could scroll back and then way over back over to here and type sudo and do it that way. But uh, one thing I find myself doing a lot when I forget something like this is I'll use the double bang. Sudo, bang, bang, exclamation, exclamation, which will insert the last command that I ran in my history. And off it goes, it's gonna go download my package and we'll be off to the races. And of course, whenever this is done, cause I'm tethering, I think, probably, yeah I am. It could take some time. I love it when my, my time counter uh, goes the wrong direction. That, that's always a good feeling when it's counting up instead of down. But of course, if I look at my history now, uh, you can see uh, number 88, it, uh, actually I'm not sure why it said sudo sudo, but uh, number 88, it injected that and I have my complete history in there. Now one of the last things I'm going to show you how to do, uh, which is useful, and if you want to dive a lot deeper, there's a phenomenal tool called tmux, the terminal multiplexer that allows you to basically within a single text editor window have multiple windows that you can interact with. But uh, I'm going to show you multitask. I'm not, not going to do this here because I'm running Docker in PowerShell and I've got some kind of key binding conflict. So I'm going to jump over here. And uh, let's do this. Uh, so this is my normal shell. This is where I spend most of my time. But if I, uh, if I just open, I don't know, Vim. I've got this running and if you're only using a single session, this is certainly the case a lot back in the day, it was kind of a hassle. You're in, you're in the middle of editing something, and then you've got to come out. Uh, but Control Z will just spend that, that task. And, um, and so now if I type something else, uh, ZSHRC, I'm in here and I can tr Control Z again. And now I've got another background job. So if I type jobs, it's showing me job one is a suspended uh, VI and job two is a suspended less. And so if I want to jump to one of these, I can type FG, I can specify which one and it will drop me back into here. If I, uh, if I just FG, now I only have one and again it will drop me back into there as well. So a very whirlwind tour of the absolute basics of the absolute basics of the command line. Uh, hopefully a lot of this was familiar, but I wanted to get you, yes, thank you Tux, thank you Lightning. But as you can see, this is our skill tree. And we've already made a pretty good dent of progress. And this is your skill tree to, uh, to navigate to become a legendary wizard. And these are kind of all of the things that we've gone through so far. Basic concepts, navigation, working with files, history, multitasking, and we, we're starting to fill this out. And so where we are, I've noticed like right here, level one, we filled out, we've got, we made some dents in other aspects of our skill tree, but this means that we get to level up. Oh, sorry. The slides will be online.
So I got my little potion of knowledge and woo, I have a wizard hat. Let's move on to our next mentor. Our next mentor is Dennis Ritchie. Um, how many people are, have at least heard that name? Okay, yeah, yeah. He was also on the uh, Unix team back at Bell Labs back in the day. Greetings, novice wizard. We created Unix to be very customizable. You now have the power to reshape your world to suit your needs. To graduate to the level of apprentice, you must demonstrate mastery of these skills. Make your environment useful and yours. So let's talk about a couple other things in here. Adding commands is generally quite simple. We've already, in fact, we've already done this. We've added nano as a new command available to us. So we'll look at a couple of uh, other things here as well. So if I jump back over to here, because we're in here now, and the reality is, out of the box, this is pretty bare bones. There's not a lot that you want to do with this. And there's a lot of capabilities, but it can feel unfriendly. There can, it can feel like there's friction points everywhere. But remember, this modular, pluggable, hackable nature of Linux and Unix, it changes everything dramatically. There's a lot of power to make something supremely useful to you. So what I would recommend doing as you spend time in here, pay attention to anywhere you find friction. Maybe it's some long but frequently used command. Uh, maybe it's just little annoying things that happen. Sometimes you, you'll type a long command and even with history it can be annoying to go back and, uh, and fix the problem. So uh, what I'll show you just kind of a, a typical example of, of how I do this. If I, I'm going to use Nano because that's a very friendly text editor. There are tools like Vim and Emacs that are super powerful, super productive, but the learning curve is like, like that. So I'm just going to open my Bash RC. This is my profile. This is all, all this stuff in here. And you'll notice there's a lot in here, it's setting colors and things like that. But if I make my way down towards the bottom, uh, there's you start seeing these aliases that are being defined. And so, for example, this is saying if uh, we've got colors, then I actually want to say when I when I alias ls, I actually want to turn on this color. So I'm not. Uh, in fact, if I if I come out of here for a second and I say Let's do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna make one of these runnable, uh, executable. So I'm gonna say ch, ch mod o plus x uh, theme dot sh. And now when I do this, it's actually gonna highlight theme green, just as a way of of saying that this is now an executable file. So that's one of the things that's happening in here already. Just in this basic configuration, it's saying that uh, that when I've got colors available to me and I type ls, it's actually going to, behind the scenes, run ls dash dash color equals auto. And I can really just sort of add any sort of alias I want in here, so I'm just going to add one. And this is, uh, uh, this is maybe something you find yourself doing a lot, which is git push origin. And now, when I am in my, in my shell, Control X, did I change my keyboard layout? Yes, I did, that's what happened. Yes, I'm gonna save that, I'm gonna save that there. Um, the first time I type this, it's gonna say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because remember that profile, that, that, that profile, my bash profile, isn't a configuration file, it's something that, that kind of gets executed and processed when I log in. Now I could log out and log in again. Uh, two things would happen, one, I'm in a Docker image, so it's going to wipe out anything I've done in here, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but either way, I don't, want, I don't have to do that anyway. I can just type source bash rc, and now it just reprocesses that, and my aliases are available to me. So if I GPO, it'll say you're not in a Git repository, but now I've got my alias. So as you're finding these little, these little friction points, you're just going to start adding these little custom commands for you. And as we go through more of this, you're going to see uh, more and more how this starts to get pretty useful. So, so we've got that in there. Um, you know, one thing that that if you're if you're playing around in here a lot, 
uh, a useful a useful little alias that you can just throw in here somewhere. And I'll just, I don't think it matters where I put these. Normally you want to keep these together, but this is an ephemeral environment. I'm going to throw it away. So I'm going to, I'm going to add another one here. I'm going to say RS bash equals alias uh, RS bash equals uh, source. And I'm going to just find that file bash RC. And come out of here, save it, write it. So I'll do that. And then now I've got RS bash and it will just rerun that file for me. So all of these places that you start to find friction, uh, that's where the, you can just start making those friction points go away. Now let's look at this third one, this enhanced shells, because if you notice when I switched over to my normal daily driver, the, the Windows subsystem for Linux on that, that I, I tend to do a lot of most of my work in when I'm booting into Windows these days. Uh, there's a lot of bells and whistles that if you haven't played in this space, then you might say, that's cool. Where do I get one of these? So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. So the, the first shell was SH. And then Steve Bourne created Bash, which is sort of an acronym for the Bourne Again shell. Um, it improved on SH, and this is typically the shell for most uh, Linux installations, but there's a bunch. Uh, for a long time on Mac, the default shell was the Z shell, there's a C shell. Uh, for a while I used a shell called FISH, which stands for the Friendly Interactive Shell. Uh, I stopped doing that in the early days. So if you, if you play around, if you look at FISH as, a, as an alternate shell, one of the first things you'll notice is, hey, there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. And the second or maybe third thing you'll notice is a lot of times when people are creating little install scripts or configuration scripts or things like that for your shell, they're going to give you a bash shell file. And you go and run it and you're going to find out that the fish shell syntax is not the same as the bash shell syntax. And uh, then you're going to spend a lot of your time trying to do a task and now you're shaving yaks because now I need to convert this to make it work with fish or you could you know copy paste it give it the chat GPT and you know hopefully it'll do something clever but um, these days I use Z shell now Z shell is sort of a superset of the bash shell so it, it is mostly largely kind of backwards compatible with all the bash stuff but you still get a lot of bells and whistles now the docker image that I have it is, uh, it's got Z shell installed already. If you are playing at home, if you were doing this at some point in the future, you might need to install Z shell with your package manager apt or, or yum or whatever the package manager is for what you're using. But it's the same kind of thing. It's gonna, it's gonna pull down, it's gonna resolve dependencies, it's gonna do a build, it's gonna put the thing where it needs to go, and you're off to the races. So, uh, Z shell, in fact, if I just type this, it's going to drop me now into a Z shell prompt. And everything largely looks similar. But if you're, one of the, you'll start to notice though, Z shell's got a more powerful history. It's got extended file globbing. It's got improved variable and array handling. It's got built in spelling correction. It's got autofill of a lot of command names. It's got themable prompts, loadable modules, a better where command nameable directories and shortcuts. But Z shell gets even better when you combine it with, uh, the, uh, a framework that I use called Oh My Z Shell. It, it allows you to manage your configurations, or as the authors put it, I've actually got this written down here. Uh, the authors put it this way Oh My Z Shell or ZSH will not make you a 10x developer, but you might feel like one. Once installed, your terminal, will, terminal shell will be the talk of the town or your money back. With each keystroke in your command prompt, you'll take advantage of the hundreds of powerful plugins and beautiful themes. Strangers will come up to you in cafes and ask you, that's amazing, are you some sort of genius? Finally, you'll be able to get the sort of attention that you felt you've always deserved. Or maybe you'll use the time that you're saving to start flossing more often. So to do this, one of the first things that we have to do is we've got to pull down, a, as these often are, a shell file. Uh, so we have to download the install.sh file. Now, if I uh, look in here, I already have install.sh. 
So I can run this. So I can use the sh command install.sh and it's going to execute this file. So here it's going to clone a git repository of oh my z shell and it's going to kind of set everything up. And uh, so once this is here, you st things start getting a lot cooler very quickly. But we're going to go further. And I should time my, my talking here while this goes. Uh, we're going to go a lot further. We're actually going to pull in a, uh, a, a really cool theme. As soon as you start looking into the Oh My Z Shell world, you're going to see a lot of themes and a lot of opinions on what the best theme is. Uh, a good place to start. There's a theme called uh, a theme called "My Internet Stopped Working," and uh, the theme is called "Power Level 10K." And I believe in you. More magic. And, you know, worst case, I've got a deck of cards in my bag. We can, you know, we could just do card tricks for the rest of the session. It'll be fine. I can use this as an object lesson on composability of, uh, uh, of, of knowledge and ideas and pieces. And uh, I don't know why I thought it was a good idea. I wanted to actually walk through this with you. I could have pre-loaded all of these things, but, but I want you to see the transformation. Uh, the other thing that I have is uh, I, I, I have some plugins that I've already, uh, that I've already picked and put out there. So I've got a syntax plugin, a highlighting plugin. I've got an auto suggestion plugin. I've got something that I absolutely love called auto. Oh, come on! Closed or not closed early? Two, yeah. And it's two thousand two hundred eighty-five bytes. How hard can that be? It's possible. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I could try the Wi-Fi again and see if that does what I hope it will do. You know, worst case, I've got it running actually on the Linux subsystem, but I like, at least it's going faster, you know, as, as we go through this. Come on, don't do the thing to me. Don't do it to me. You know, years ago, I read about a guy and, um... His name is escaping me. Uh, Franz Reichelt. His name is Franz Reichelt. Uh, Franz Reichelt was, uh, was a tinkerer, an inventor. He, uh, he was not satisfied with the status quo. He was always working on little inventions. And, and one of the inventions that he came up with, it's still doing things, I like this. One of the inventions that Franz Reichelt came up with was an overcoat that would... Uh, turn into a parachute, kind of like Batman, you know, when he jumps off and, and everything, and then he lands safely. Uh, so I am a skydiver, and I, and I have a reasonable understanding of, of how these things work, and I don't think the Batman thing would work, but there's a lot of stuff in the comic book universes that, uh, uh, well, I didn't think would work. I didn't think Jarvis was, was realistic, and now we all kind of have one, which is neat. Although, I think Jarvis is smarter than, than ChatGPT. Hey, things are happening. So Franz Reichelt invented this thing, this obnoxious overcoat that would somehow turn into a parachute in theory. Uh, he's a man after my own heart. He likes to test in production. So he called a press conference and at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And he goes all the way to the top and he dons his overcoat and he says, uh, let me show you my new invention. And then he jumps off the Eiffel Tower. I wish uh, this story had a happy ending. It doesn't. It did not end well for Franz Reichold. In fact, it just ended for Franz Reichold. Um, I tell you that story for two reasons. Uh, one, it's cool that we get to stand on the shoulders of giants, that, that, that we are benefiting from the mistakes, countless mistakes that people who came before us have made. And two, it is a reminder that no matter how bad a demo goes, it could be worse. <laughs> All right, so I've pulled down Oh My Z Shell. It actually worked this time. And it says, do you want to change your default shell? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And now we're in here and I've got, oh, look at that ASCII art. I've got all these cool things. 
And, uh, and now I've got this beautiful shell. But let's do it. Let's go a little further. Uh, by the way, the, um, uh, the ASCII art that was in my keynote, little command line utility. Uh, uh, hmm? Figlet. Yeah, thank you. Say that one more time. Figlet, yes. My brain kept autocorrecting to Figma, which is not the same thing. Figlet, little command line utility. You, you put it in there and you get ASCII art. You pipe that into another utility and it will rainbow color it for you. I mean, there's so many cool things out there. The low cat, yes. I'll oh, see. You. We'll trade. I want to sit there. That looks like the more fun place to sit. But there's a lot of these cool little utilities. All of them do just one thing. And it's so cool when you start piecing these things together. How are we on time, by the way? 6.30. Uh, when do we stop? 6.30. Oh, far out. Okay. I, I, I thought we had another 30 minutes for some reason. Okay. No, we're good. All right. Uh, so, uh, I'm actually going to run... Uh, let's see, what do I have? Yeah, uh, so there we are. I'm actually going to pull in uh, another theme, and the thing, theme is called Power Level 10K. And uh, so I've actually got a bunch of these things in here, but let's try to pull this down, and I'll show this to you. Because there's one more thing I want to show you before we wrap up, but let's see if that's going to just pull down. Probably fine. I have every faith in the world. But this is also probably a smaller, smaller Git repository to clone. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so I've pulled down that theme. And in fact, I'm going to pull down some plugins as well. So if I, in this, in this document, I've got a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to actually take the, uh, uh, I'm going to pull down some, some plugins as well and kind of show you some of these things. But, uh. Uh, I'm going to pull down uh, the Z shell auto suggestions. I'm going to pull down auto jump. I'm going to pull down a bunch of these. And uh, the one thing about auto jump, auto jump is one of my favorite little tools that I just use all the time. Makes my life better. Uh, that's one I think you have to also install. So you have to sudo apt install or sudo apt install auto jump. A uh, bunch of things are going to happen here. Uh, so it's it's pulling down and just cloning these repos into my plugins folder. And what I'm going to do once this is all there is I'm going to add these plugins to my configuration and, and I'm going to change my theme and it's going to allow me to kind of prompt and uh, to, to customize and theme my prompt and all of these things. So yeah, syntax highlighting. I hope I did these alphabetically. That means I'm at the end. Otherwise, I have more stories about uh, uh, people whose demos didn't go well. Somebody described uh, any kind of li live coding in, at a conference like this. It's sort of the, the high wire act of the conference world, you know, and I don't know. I spend a lot more, more of my time kind of here than there, but um, I, I, I feel like the high wire is one of those things that... I, I, there's like a morbid curiosity there. Like, is somebody going to fall this time? You know, they have nets. They'll be okay. But you always have to wonder. Or uh, I know some people who are, are into certain kind of branches of motorsports that it's the crashes that are the most exciting. Uh, how is it for you when the demos fail? Because I know what it's like for me. How is it for you? Are you just like, oh, okay, we're all human? Or is it a... Uh, Oh, this is what I came to see. Or are you just like angry at the speaker that uh, that the demo didn't work? L you know, a little bit of all of them. I don't know. Good, it, it could be, but we're all human. And ninety-six <clears throat> percent. Also, K I B M I B. Does anybody know what those uh, what that means? What the difference between K I B and K B? They are kibby bits uh, and mebby me 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 bits. Um, so we know what a kilobyte is. Do we know what a kibby byte is? It's one of my favorite tech trip. Hmm? A, a kilobyte is a thousand and a kibby byte is a thousand twenty-four. 
because uh, everybody kind of got mad at us programmers because the rest of the world is like, no, kilo as a prefix means something. Mega as a prefix, mega, giga, tera, they all mean something. They're orders of magnitude. They're, they're powers of 10. So let's go in here and I'm going to change my ZSH theme to power level 10K slash power level 10K. And while I'm in here, I'm actually going to just turn on some of my plugins. So if I jump down, you'll see somewhere in here all my plugins. By default, you get git, but I just installed a bunch. So I have command not found, history, sudo, zsh auto suggestions, uh, zsh syntax, highlighting, highlighting, uh, zsh. Z, which is kind of a, a variant on auto jump, but I use auto jump. And uh, ah, Josh, yeah, a, 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 a distant relative of Josh. <laughs> All right, so now we know I need to source my ZSHRC, and it's going to start prompting me for things. Now, what I've done for my config for configuring my theme. Now, what I've done is I've installed something called a nerd font, which is sort of like <clears throat> or your standard monospace font, but it has all these icons like font awesome in there. And so this is trying to figure out the capabilities of my font. It says, is that a diamond? Yes, it is. Is that a lock? Yes, it is. Is that an arrow? Yes, it is. Does that look right? Yes, it does. Do I want Unicode or ASCII? Ooh, I like the Unicode. Uh, do I want to show the current time? Uh, sure. Let's use the 24 hour format. One line or two lines. I'll go for two lines. So you can start it gives you a lot of options to customize your your prompt. Uh, let's say uh, uh, no frame. Let's go for uh, black. Let's go for compact. Let's go for many icons. I like icons. And I will take the fluent. Uh, no, I don't want the transient prompt. Instant prompt mode, verbose, recommended. Sounds good to me. Apply changes, yes. And it's going to go do some things. And we suddenly start to get uh, a really cool prompt for us. And while that's cooking, here's one I made earlier. So you'll notice, uh, let's just do this. Uh, yeah, sure, we'll jump here. And you'll notice a couple things. Uh, so I, I've got kind of an abbreviated prompt here. It's showing me that this is a GitHub repo. I'm on the main branch. So if I say git uh, branch uh, one, and then git switch one, you'll notice in my prompt now, as soon as it does the switch, which I would have expected to be faster than this, I have no idea what's happening. Uh, it would change the branch that I'm on. So I get a lot of feedback just in my prompt of different things that are going, going through there. Um, but a couple of the things that uh, that you start to get with like the, the enhanced history, uh, whatever. I'm not sure why that's not working. Oh, yeah. I wonder why it's doing that. So the... Um, so you'll notice this. Uh, when I type start to type a command, it will auto-suggest the last command that I started there. Now, if I start scrolling up, with uh, a lot of these things, I get, I, I get a filtered view of my history. Uh, another one that I really like, so the way that auto jump works is I can just type the letter J, um, and let's see if I can find something that, uh, yeah. I could just type any part of the path, J and any part of the path, if I have been there before, if it is in my history, then it will automatically jump me to that place. So yeah, that J-H-E-N, it's going to drop me into this folder called Henry. If I say J-Foam, it's going to drop me into this whole path. And so another big piece of friction just starts to go away. That's going to take forever. So let me move on, and I'm actually going to uh, let that cook. I'm going to jump back into here. So that's the, the, the enhanced shells. And again, we're starting to build up our, our skill tree a little more. That means, of course, we get another level up. We are now a level five apprentice wizard.
And one more piece that I want to show you because this is really where it all comes together. Because it's going to take, yeah, you got my robes of knowledge or whatever, my, my, my wizard robes. And it continues. But one more, and this is where everything starts to change. We have uh, Linus Torvalds as our third mentor on our journey. Welcome, apprentice. I see you're beginning to bend and reshape the universe to your will. And you have learned some individual spells. To become a journeyman wizard, you must learn the art of composing multiple spells to conjure new realities at will. As your knowledge of spells increases, so shall your powers. Let me show you the way. So this third piece, and this is where we're going to wrap, but there is so much more in the skill tree, is uh, just this idea of pipes and redirection, because that's really where the magic starts to happen. So kind of in here... Uh, the basically, you know, we talked about a little bit of the history, and all of these, you know, the Unix was created. These a bunch of spin-offs happened. I talked about BSD. Uh, IBM had AIX. Microsoft had Xenix. Silicon Graphics had IRIX. Uh, there are a bunch of these different Unix systems out there. Uh, Andrew Tannenbaum created Minix as a teaching tool, and that, of course, inspired his student, Linus, to uh, create his own operating system, and it eventually got called Unix. Now, all of these were roughly compatible, but eventually it got standardized by the IEEE into the Portable Operating System Interface, or POSIX. And one of the notable standards is the command line interface. So a pipeline is just a mechanism for inter-process communication. And a pipeline is just a chain of commands, uh, a set of commands that are chained together by their standard stream. So standard in, standard out. And when, a, when you start a command, the first process gets, the second process gets started while the first one is still executing. And everything happens concurrently. So the key thing here is if I say ls-l uh, user bin or usr bin, I get a whole bunch of things. But I can take that output and I can use the pipe command to pipe that as input to another command. By the way, you'll notice this as well. Now that I'm in bash, if I say, if I make a little typo, it highlights that in red. If it's correct, it's highlighted in green. So this is just another nice thing that you start getting with D shell and some of these plugins. But I can take the output of that one command, and instead of having it go into my terminal, I'm taking that as an input to the next command, in this case, more. And this now allows me to start paging through this. Now here, I'm actually using the original more, so I can't go up, and it's paged down at a time. Uh, but I, if I want, I can also pipe that into less. And now I can go up, I can go down, I can actually search. Uh, or I'll use the X command. So what less also uses, it uses a lot of the VI syntax. Um, so again, as you're learning these things, the knowledge, the conventions, they start to show up all over the place. So I can, um, I can now take the output of one utility Type it into the next one. Uh, another one is this idea of redirects. So there's a there's a command that's part of these standard distributions called uh, uh, seq or sequence. So if I say seq 50, it's going to give me a sequence of numbers from 1 to 50. It's more useful at times than you might think. But um, I can pipe that into another command that's going to randomize it. But maybe I want these actually in a file. So I'm using this single single uh, chevron to write this into a file. I can call it shuffled uh, number.txt, and it's going to write that out. So I can see that that's in there now. Uh, the single chevron will, will create or overwrite a file, but if I want to append, I can go in here and do a double chevron, and that will append to the file. Uh, there's a whole lot of these little tools that we can start to put together, and what you find as you start going through this space is that all these little ad hoc utility things that you need day to day, like you need to call an API and pull, just pull the token out, um, make your curl call or your wget or httpi, http. HTTPIE, I don't know, HTTPI, I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Any of these little uh, HTTP clients, you can use these 
and I can pipe that into JQ, which is a, J, uh, uh, a JSON kind of query language to pull out just that token. And I can pipe that in and dump that into a environment variable. And now all of my little tests in here, it's going to be able to pull these things out. Uh, so again, we start to fill out our skill tree. We get to level up yet again. We're now a level 15 journeyman wizard. And we did this in, in, in just under an hour. And, you know, as you go through, you know, you'll meet Andrew Tannenbaum uh, working with files. We'll meet, uh, yeah, we get to level up again. Now we get a glowing staff, the GNU, over and over and over again. But um, broadly speaking, here is our skill tree. Uh, keep playing around in here. I've got a lot of these exercises if you want to follow along and do these things to, uh, to keep going because ultimately you want to level up to Legendary Wizard and this is a fun place to be. But I do believe we're out of time and so uh, your journey is just beginning so I will let this uh, play me out. Thank you so much, everybody.